Hey everyone, I just wanted to follow up on my last video, as I promised, by recording another video that sort of delves in to examples of different proposed specific gun control measures and give my take on them. Do I think they can be justified? Do I think they cannot be, etc., etc.? To start, there's a proposal, it's actually more of a general attitude that we hear often brought up by gun control advocates, namely, why don't we regulate guns like cars in this country? Why don't we ensure that anyone who wants a license to use a gun has to prove to the government first via some kind of training and test that they are competent to use a firearm in a way that is safe and responsible in the same way that people have to do in order to use cars, at least on public roads. Well, this issue has actually already been addressed a number of times over by more than a few gun rights advocates and other commentators on the issue. For example, one uh, law professor of whom I'm a big fan, a fellow libertarian, Professor Eugene Volokh of uh, the U UCLA School of Law, has already written on this subject. There's a link to his article included below this video. One thing he points out is that Actually, in many respects, most key respects, guns already are regulated more or less the way cars are throughout most of the U.S. in roughly 40 states. He points out that the main elements of licensing and regulation of cars are as follows. No federal licensing or registration of car owners. Any person can actually use a car on his or her own private property without any license or registration. Any adult and in most states, 16 or 17 year olds as well, can get a license to use a car in public places by passing a fairly simple test that virtually everyone can pass. I'm quoting verbatim from Professor Volokh's article here. Number four, you can use your license for proved misuse of the car, but not for most other misconduct. And even if you lose your driver's license, you can usually regain it sometime later. Number five, your license from one state is good throughout the country. End of quote. Professor Volokh goes on to explain, actually, that's already the case. Those criteria are already applied to gun licensing in the more than 40 states that now allow law-abiding adults to get a license to carry a concealed gun. So actually, in at least 40 states of the Union, this kind of regime already is in place. And so in key respects, one can argue that guns already are regulated like cars. And if that regime is inadequate, as far as gun control advocates are concerned, if the status quo is inadequate, then what you're really asking for is for guns to be regulated more onerously than cars. But there's one area where I would like to finesse Professor Volokh's point just a little bit. I'm not sure he gave this issue as much as attention as it deserves. I think the key criterion that gun control advocates have in mind when they say regulate guns like cars is that they want to ensure that people can certify and demonstrate competence with a firearm, that they know how to store a firearm safely, that they know how to carry it safely and responsibly, and that they know how to use it in self-defense using certain techniques that are likely to maximize their chances of using the gun in a way that's responsible and doesn't inflict needless risk or harm on other people. So that really pertains to criterion number three of the criteria on the list that Professor Volokh mentioned. He said, and I quote again, any adult may get a license to use a car in public places by passing a fairly simple test that virtually everyone can pass, end of quote. He also goes on to note, there is a simple routine test through which any law-abiding citizen can get a state license to carry a gun in public in most states, end of quote. So what I'm not sure of is that in most of those states, the test that you have to pass in order to be issued a license to carry a gun in public is that onerous. I'm still looking into this, but I'm not sure just how rigorous and demanding the criteria in those tests really are. And that's really where the rubber meets the road. How easy is it for a law-abiding adult citizen to get his or her hands on a gun legally and carry that gun in public legally? Maybe those criteria need to be toughened. You know, I could definitely see that. And I think that that would be a good example of the kind of gun control regulation that I think is justified morally and constitutionally based on the Second Amendment right to bear arms. And as I've remarked in the past, in my video from last fall, a link to which I've also included beneath this video, I think that given the nature of guns as weapons and their capacity to do harm, the right to bear arms is necessarily going to have to be subjected to perhaps more limits than most other constitutional rights. And rightly so. We're talking about weapons here, people. It makes perfect sense for society through government, alas, to impose certain 
basic conditions, certain basic criteria for carrying a gun in public where it can easily do a great deal of harm if the user is not competent, the user is not properly trained. But there's another gun control proposal that's on the table right now that I think is downright disturbing, not even just ineffective or possibly unconstitutional, but downright disturbing. We hear a lot right now about not allowing people on the FBI's terrorism screening database, which is basically the so-called terror watch list, to uh, buy guns legally. Some people are referring to it as the so-called terror gap. Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy actually conducted a filibuster lasting 14 hours on Wednesday, demanding that Congress take that measure. But the problem with that is, and I think um, the ACLU itself has pointed this out, the terrorism screening database or the terror watch list is not something that's currently implemented with respect for due process norms. It's maintained in secrecy behind, you know, locked doors at the FBI. Anonymous government officials are the ones who decide whose name goes on the list and whose name doesn't. No one is notified when his or her name is added to the list, and there are no properly established procedures in the courts for getting your name taken off the list. Apparently, some people have had to go through years of expensive litigation just to get their names taken off the list after they were mistakenly included on the list. And that, of course, includes the no-fly list, which is generally compiled using names from the terror watch list. It's swept a whole bunch of innocent people into its ambit, in that dragnet. Some people, including former senator from Massachusetts Ted Kennedy, actually ended up on the no-fly list because the whole thing is done in such a haphazard manner. I think people with the name Robert Johnson were swept up in that dragnet and added to the list for no good reason. I mean, the terror watch list and the no-fly list are ripe with problems. To take away people's constitutional rights or their freedom to travel, for that matter, based on that kind of legal tool, I think is a terrible idea. And I think it's the kind of thing that in all likelihood does violate the Second Amendment. I think the ACLU has actually taken the position that the terror watch list or the no-fly list should not be used as a basis for depriving American citizens of the use of legal firearms until the problems with that list or those lists are fixed first. I totally agree with that position. And we're talking about the ACLU here. We're not talking about the NRA, the big, bad, evil gun nuts. We're talking about liberal civil libertarians here. It's understandable that people would reach out for that kind of proposal in these times, but that doesn't make it the right way to go at the end of the day. Now, what's an example of a gun control regulation that I think would be justified right off the bat? I've actually delivered a speech on this subject in the past. Again, you can see a link to it underneath this video. There are laws in some states that make it illegal for people who have been convicted of domestic violence to acquire legal guns. As you'll see if you take a look at the speech that I delivered just before I graduated from law school three years ago, I agree with that kind of law. I think it passes constitutional muster, and I think it's totally justifiable on a political and moral level as well. At the end of the day, if you have actually been convicted of domestic violence in the past, and you had an opportunity to defend yourself, you had a fair trial, subject to the norms of due process and so on, and you were found guilty of committing domestic violence, then I think it makes sense to hold that you've forfeited your right to bear arms. There are statistics that show that a lot of domestic violence-related gun crime is carried out by repeat offenders. There's a high recidivism rate. And so I think that it is justified to take away domestic abusers' right to bear arms. I think that that kind of reasonable gun control measure is a complement to the right to bear arms itself, at least for the purpose of self-defense. Combined, they basically aim to give law-abiding citizens a fighting chance against violent attackers and abusers. You try to keep guns out of the hands of would-be attackers and abusers out of real bona fide criminals in the first place so that they're not able to use them to inflict harm and death on innocent people. And at the same time, you allow innocent people the means to defend themselves against the criminals out there who do manage to get their hands on weapons, despite the government's best efforts to keep guns out of their hands. The two go together, folks. And so for that reason, I think that that would be a good example of a legitimate gun control measure. When it comes to the issue of stopping these gun massacres that keep occurring in American society, I don't pretend that the problem has an easy solution. At least I don't think that the problem has a simple, straightforward solution in American society specifically. And I say that because of America's gun culture, the fact that there are already more than 300 million guns circulating out there, and of course the Second Amendment. Now, some other countries like Australia have 
vastly brought down their gun, their rates of gun crime and particularly mass shootings by implementing comprehensive gun confiscation programs. Aside from the Second Amendment issues that that kind of policy would raise in the United States, there's just the political obstacles that it would face. When it comes to gun buybacks, like one of the main measures on which the Australian policy relied 20 years ago after the Port Arthur massacre of 1996, I don't know that many American gun owners would be willing to give up their guns voluntarily to the government, even for compensation. After each of these massacres, gun owners keep fearing that some new gun control measure may be right around the corner, and so they just go out and buy more guns. This is not the kind of scenario that lends itself to an effective gun buyback program. I'm not saying that there is no solution, that nothing should be done, but I don't think that just any old thing should be done either. I think something should be done, but that something has to be shown to be likely to be effective. And if that's not the case, then I don't believe in implementing those policies just for the emotional catharsis of being able to say, well, we tried to do something. If the something is useless, if it's pointless, there's no point implementing it at all. I think that we need to take a good, long, hard look at all the evidence in this situation before we run off half-cocked, implementing foolhardy laws left and right that may not actually stand a chance of doing some good. That's my general take on the gun control issue. Feel free to leave your comments, give me your feedback, and as always, I look forward to the discussion. And of course, I keep the victims in Orlando and all the other horrific atrocities that have been committed in recent years in my thoughts and prayers, for whatever that's worth.